Good evening, everyone. Um, hello, hello. May I have your attention? Uh, good evening. Um, my name is Sasha Dovzhuk. I'm the Special Projects Curator at the Ukrainian Institute London. And I'm thrilled to welcome you to the evening with the Ukrainian writer, Katrina Babkina. Um, It is such a pleasure to welcome Katerina here in London and to have her tonight with us. I'll do a very short introduction and then we'll just uh, immerse ourselves in the world of Ukrainian poetry and Katya's magic. Uh, so Katerina Babkina, as I mentioned, is a Ukrainian writer, poet, playwright, um, columnist, screenwriter. I'm sure I'll miss a few things, but Katya will add. Uh, she is the author of one novel, Sonia, uh, two collections of short stories, Happy Naked People and Lilu After You, and uh, a novel that is told through a series of short stories, which is absolutely fascinating. It's called My Grandfather Dances, best, dances the Best. Uh, I'm a great fan of uh, Katarina's short stories because they are very sharp, very condensed, very emotionally intelligent. And you'll have an opportunity to, if you haven't read them yet, you'll have an opportunity to buy books after our reading and uh, get acquainted with uh, Katya's short stories as well as her poetry. Um, uh, Katarina has authored five books of poetry. <laughs> yes, yes. It's a good sign when an author cannot quite, quite count how many she's, uh, she's done already. Um, and um, <laughs> you'll be able to uh, buy those books uh, like after one of them as well. Um, approximately once per fortnight, one of my friends sends me a poem written by Katerina, or I see it in the stories of my friends on social media, which says a lot about how relatable people find uh, Katrina's poetic language and again her emotional intelligence and the experiences she is able to convey in her poetry. Um, without further ado, I think that we should start with a reading. So we'll uh, read one poem uh, in Ukrainian and then we'll hear the English translation and one, uh, then we'll talk a bit more. Um, Thank you very you much. Ready. Thank you so much, Sasha, for such a kind introduction. And I want to welcome you all here and to thank you all for um, coming to, to see me, to listen to my poetry. I want to thank Ukrainian Institute London for organizing uh, this amazing event and to encourage you to follow uh, other their events for they are organizing a lot of interesting and uh, like in intellectually useful uh, stuff here in London as well as in, in other places in uh, UK. Uh, the reason I'm here now is not very nice, like I'm basically a refugee uh, with my daughter and my mother. I'm hiding here from, from the war disaster uh, caused by Russian aggression uh, towards Ukraine. And I want to thank you all for, for all your support and all your solidarity that uh, Ukrainians of United Kingdom as well as people, the people of UK are showing and opening their hearts and homes to Ukraine. Thank you very much for supporting us and for staying with us and for speaking up for us. I'm going to read poetry in Ukrainian. We're going to have a discussion in English. Uh, in case there are some people who do not understand uh, English at all, I might repeat some, some important things in, in Ukrainian as well. Also, I definitely gonna do some mistakes. I'm sorry for that. I, I try my best. Uh, whatever works. Yeah, and I, I'm kind of quiet, but I will try to, to read. To read so everybody can hear me. Just in case you don't, please let us know so we will speak louder, okay? Ne pytaj mene jak ja. Спитай мене щось просте. Подивися, моє волосся тепер так швидко росте, ніби має окрему цілком конкретну мету, коли все це скінчиться. Я ним тебе оплету. Не кажи мені, як ти, щось легше скажи мені. Адже кожен навіть 
Найменший камінь у цій війні обернувся на зброю, щоб боронити своє. Не кажи мені, як це, бо ж це все, що у тебе є. Коли дзвін б'є на сполох, ударна хвиля під дих, навіть мертві з землі цієї встають за своїх живих, і як вони виють тоскно голосами нічних сирен, не кажи мені, бо для такого навіть немає імен. Бо для такого немає ні часу, ні місця, ані вимірів, ані сфер. Але все це відбувається просто тут і тепер, серед затишних ринків, приміських дворів, нічних забудов і все, що після такого може зцілити, то хіба любов. Любов зможе стулити докупи розчахнуті ран краї. Зможе живити собою потужні рійки та ручаї, зможе змити наругу, оплакати щедро кожну пролиту кров. Але поки це все не скінчиться, не кажи мені про любов. Краще, допоки зблизькі нічні, змінює передранкова синь, взагалі нічого не кажи мені. Відпочинь. I'd like to invite Phoebe Page, uh, one of our team who will help us tonight uh, to read the English versions of the uh, poems. Don't ask me how I am. Ask me something simple. Look how quickly my hair grows now. It seems to have its own special goal. When all this is over, I'll braid it around you. Don't tell me how you are. Tell me something easier. Even the smallest stone has turned into a weapon to defend its own in this war. Don't say how this can be true, because that is all you have. When the bell rings in warning and the shock wave takes your breath away, here, even the dead rise up from the ground to defend the living. Oh, how they wail with longing like sirens in the night. Don't try to tell me, because there is no word to describe it. There is no time, no place, no dimension, no sphere. It all happens here and now, in quiet markets, schoolyards, suburban buildings. After all this, what can cure us? Maybe it's love. Love can bind together the ripped edges of the wounds. It can feed the powerful rivers and streams. It can wash away the abuse, properly mourn all the spilt blood. But until all this is over, don't talk to me of love. Till the pale light of early dawn replaces the flashes of dark night. Better, don't say anything to me at all. Just rest. Do some juggling with the microphone. Um, so, at so those are two two seconds when I can, uh, in advance, to thank the translators of my poetry, which has been translated uh, mostly by Vilana Tkach and Wanda Phipps from uh, New York, but also uh, by Ukrainian translator uh, Leo Hrytsuk, who has passed away already, unfortunately. And yeah. Thanks to them, and let's just relax a little bit because I feel certain tension because of dropping the microphone all the time. So, in case you feel like having your drinks or I don't know, I guess just we'll just let, a let's talk yes. a little chat and yes, uh, let's let's do some chat and relax uh, a little bit to because us, uh, say silly things or not so silly. Uh, since you've mentioned your translators, uh, I I have a question uh, for you about language. Um, Ukraine celebrated the day of Ukrainian language uh, on Wednesday, a few days ago, and it was celebrated widely and with uh, uh, a lot of feelings this year because we finally realized that our language is something that defines us, that distinguishes us, something that we cherish a lot. Uh, many Ukrainians uh, have finally made this uh, switch, uh, many Russian-speaking Ukrainians have made the switch to the Ukrainian language. I come from a um, Russian-speaking family, a Russian-speaking region of Zaporizhia. Uh, I made this switch a couple of years ago in 2014. Uh, but for many people in our country, this this year marks this fundamental change. So I, I have a question for Katya, because I know that Ukrainian is your language of choice. Uh, it's something that you've chosen, or, or has it chosen you? What are your thoughts about uh, the Ukrainian language? 
With a lot of Ukrainian people, I grew up in Russian-speaking family. I did not, like Sasha, grew up in Russian-speaking region. I grew up in Western Ukraine, which was very pro-Ukrainian. But then in the military town, for my grandfather was a uh, Soviet commander, Soviet officer, and he would do his service here and there. And just when Soviet Union collapsed, we ended up uh, at the west part of Ukraine in ivano frankivsk uh, so we would be those Russian-speaking people uh, literally oppressed by the surrounding and I guess just now did I understand those people who would like hearing the child speaking Ukrainian because I had some issues with that like teachers would at school teachers would make my marks lower knowing that I'm Russian speaking and as a child and as a teenager I would put myself of course in the opposition to the surroundings so I would like protect my right to speak my home language which was Russian and I guess just now uh, I understood those people who were so aggressively acting here in Russian because I do have the same feeling now Russian speaking people are those who came to kill us and then when it comes to a uh, conversation that historically some Ukrainians are Russian speaking well they forced to be Russian speaking historically uh, which you can basically uh, learn without me just check out some some acts of forbidden Ukrainian language Ukrainian education Ukrainian literature Ukrainian poetry killing or imprisoning Ukrainian intellectuals and whatsoever which lasted approximately three or three to four hundred years from Russian Emperor and to, to, to the Soviet Union so uh, at some point, when I discovered all of that, because I grew up in, in, in a Soviet family, uh, they were nice people, and they are nice people, but totally like brainwashed. For instance, my surname is Babkina, which you all know probably as soon as you are here. But uh, until the beginning of 20th century, uh, precisely until the date of birth of my grandfather, who danced better than everybody else, uh, who was born like... Um, 16 years before the Second World War, his mother, having the surname Babko, which is archetype, archetype Ukrainian surname, would go and write down the surname of all her three children as Babkini, Babkin for, for the man or Babkina for my grandfather's sister Luda, for Russian surname would make their life easier so that is how I, 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 I became Babkina actually mm -hmm. and uh, when I learned all those things and the other versions of history I thought something must be wrong with that I speak the Russian language from home and also all my family would identify themselves as Russian people however my grandmother was born next in the small town Korostin next to Zhitomer. My grandfather uh, was born in a uh, uh, small village Rubizhnoye next to Starobilsk, which are like originally Ukrainian territories. And my mother was born in Korostin too. So how come are you guys Russian really? But they, they would call themselves like Ruskie Ludi. <laughs> My Ruskie Ludi, okay. And my mother, Okay, she's not, she's, she's not saying that anymore since the last, I don't know, 10 or something years, but she still insists on her right to speak Russian. And it feels kind of stupid because she even here, staying here mm -hmm. with me, she still speaks Russian to me. Because this is her mother's language and she don't, now that the position is, she don't want to give it to Russian aggressor. This is her language, but <laughs> whatsoever. So, but there was another important part of this choice for I discovered not only uh, some parts of history and some, some, some different points of view, but I discovered some different surrounding. Like I discovered those people of Halicina and Bukovina uh, from the, as we call them, uh, Stara Intelligentsia, the old uh, noble people who did their university studies in Vienna or somewhere in Prague, in Brno, who uh, belonged less to the Soviet area. Instead, they were the part of Austro-Hungarian Empire and then the, the Poland or whatsoever districts there were. So they were better educated. Mm -hmm. 
read more, spoke on different subjects, they would uh, be writers, painters, they would have history of their families, you know, you would come to visit some of your classmates and you would see the library that has 300 years. Uh, unlike in our house, because my, my family moved to Ivana Frankivs like five years before Soviet Union collapsed, so they did not have any roots nowhere because uh, all the Soviet people were very used to be replaced, thrown here and there, sent to Siberia, brought back, sent to here, sent to there, like have the starvation, the war whatsoever. That, that was the destiny of Soviet people. However, th those part of Western Ukrainian society who spent less time in the Soviet, Soviet country, they were very different. And I must admit, I liked them more. And as a teenager, being like 14, 15, I wanted more to belong to this, this circle of people. For I, they, they knew so much more about art, about literature, about the world. They have been to different places, like they have really been to Paris, to Nice, to America, even to Canada. So something that my mother would read only about in the books. And of course, like being 15, 14, I have never seen any abroad countries in my life and they would tell like oh when we were visiting our family in Paris we saw this and that and Mona Lisa and uh, Opera Galinier and whatsoever so I kind of wanted to belong to that uh, they, they did not call it that that way but like the western pro-Western part of Ukraine not Soviet part of Ukraine I did not have this category in my mind back then but Basically, this is what I have chosen. Also, um, what, what is important to mention among those people, there were some, excuse me, gay people and uh, people who have chosen not to have children and would speak about that openly. And this is basically not what had happened before in like pro-Soviet state of mind people. Like, what, what do you mean gay people? <laughs> there, there were no gay people in, in Soviet <laughs> Union or whatsoever. So also no sex, that, right? that, you know, sex, obviously. <laughs> Come on. So yeah, this is what I liked more. And a lot of years, I, I, I'm not revealing this, though you can check my age on Wikipedia, but a lot of years have passed and I'm still choosing that. For now, it's not only language, of course, it's basically everything I do is to confirm the choice, but I'm still choosing that. Thank you, Katya. <laughs> This was like a cultural history of Ukraine. Okay, the second Ukraine. time. That's fine, that's fine. It's still with us. Okay. Uh, cultural history of <laughs> if Ukraine. If I drop it five times, I'm paying all the drinks. I'm kidding. But this, this would motivate me not to. If I drop um, it five times, I'm paying the new microphone. Okay? I think um, it's time for us to listen to more poetry, if you don't mind, if you feel ready. Yes. Um, that would be nice, because poetry is basically what you are here for. Um, and I would like to invite Phoebe, and we'll do the microphone switch for one more time. And I think we need to buy more mics. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, we're going to have more questions and more conversation after the, the, after the break, we'll right? Have, we'll have a reading, uh, let's say, for poems now, and then we'll have a conversation uh, between the two of us, and then I'll open the floor to the questions. Does it sound good, right? It sounds great. Yeah. When you're ready. Dedo, прийом. Я виросла, дістаю до педалей і легко орієнтуюсь по моху в хащах нічного саду. Їжджу на автоматі, нашим зрадила ідеалам. Мені вже не так цікаво, що же там далі, тим більше, що стільки із того далі тепер позаду. В шахи не граю, все ще не вивчила поіменно всіх бородатих гуру твого історичного комунізму, не народила, не зустріла справжнього мене, але це вже неправда. Стріляла в публічному місці, падала п'яна в сену, нічим пишатись, все радше із списку різна. А тебе розслабився. Всі навколо дорослі, а не трохи не діти. Нікому нічого не винні, все робимо швидко і не навзаєм. Постійно не вистачає на щось, без чого ніяк не можна радіти. Втім, там, де ти зараз є, ти значно краще знаєш, що таке немає часу і що часу взагалі немає. Мама не вийшла заміж, в мене все та ж освіта. Курим удвох на балконі і їздимо часом за місто. 
І я засинаю без казок і платівок. Але на початку літа прокидаюся часто і захлинаюся від повітря, світла і світу. Цього прекрасного світу, котрий неясно з чим їсти. Grandpa, come in. Do you read me? I've grown and can now reach the pedals. I also find my way in the bushes at night by how the moss grows. I have betrayed our ideals and now drive an automatic. I'm not as interested in what's ahead, since so much of what was ahead is now behind. Never learned to play chess, and still can't name those bearded gurus of your beloved old communism. Haven't given birth, haven't met a real man yet. I've shot a gun and fell down drunk in the Seine, Nothing to brag about, but now that's off my list. You could relax here these days. Adults only, nothing childish about us. We don't owe anybody anything. Everything's quick, no fuss. But constantly, something is lacking, so we're never truly happy. Where you are now, you must know what it means not to have the time, since time is nothing you can have. Mother never got married, but got me educated. We smoke together on the balcony and go out of town once in a while. Now I fall asleep without fairy tales or records. But when summer comes, I often wake up gasping for air, light and life. This beautiful life. Tell me, what does it taste good with? I must admit it feels a little bit odd like reading aloud a poetry which I have written like long time before uh, the full scale invasion invasion because the first one I read is something that I, I uh, have written in March right after like still before Bucha even before we, we discovered what what had happened there but yes let's have some some um, something from before something from before even the war started started in 2014. Знеболювальна існодіна. З міста, котре ніколи не дає тобі спати. Пестить тебе так солодко, чавить так безнадійно, друзі просили різне. Соуси, фотоапарати, косметику, якусь мозаїку, пиздувату, телефони, насіння, кеди. І тільки Катя попросила. Знеболювальна існодіна. Господи, проведи нас в Бруклін без GPS-а. Перепиши нам візи, скончених на постійні, я би здала їй всіх борделів і барів, адреси, я привезла б їй чайку чи чорношкіру принцесу, але вона просила знеболювальне і снодійне. Всі трудові мігранти, бляді, стипендіати, менеджери, няні, бабки діаспорійні, всі, хто сюди дістався в радості помирати, потерпають від болю і моляться на ніч матом, запивають знеболювальне, малячі про снодійне. Татя, над океаном ніч заплутує сіті. На найдальшому стріті, в найбруднішому барі, нудиться ще до того, як замовив і випив. І всім нам болить так само. Тобі і мені, і дітям рибалок із чайна тауна, котрі не сплять, щоб ловити свіжі морепродукти для досвітніх базарів. Really? I'm gonna make some comment after after Phoebe reads the, the English version. I'm gonna make make some comment on it. For this is something important to tell. Painkillers and sleeping pills. From the city that never lets you sleep, which caresses so sweetly and presses so harshly, friends ask for so many different things: sources, cameras, cosmetics, and fucking mosaic, telephones, seeds, keds. But Katya asks for painkillers and sleeping pills. Lord, lead us into Brooklyn without our GPS. Change our visas from temporary to permanent. I would give her the addresses of all the bordellos and bars. I'd bring her a seagull or even a dusky princess. But she wanted painkillers and sleeping pills. All the migrant workers, whores and scholarship students, managers, nannies and diaspora grannies who came here to die happy, suffer from pains and curse through their prayers at night, take painkillers and dream about sleeping pills. Katya. Night tangles the nets in the ocean. It nauseates you before you order it and drink on the furthest street in the dirtiest bar. We all hurt the same. You, me, and the kids of the Chinatown fishermen who don't sleep to catch the freshest seafood for the markets at dawn. Thank you, Sidney. 
so back in 2012, I went for two months to New York and I got a lot of requests from my friends in Ukraine what to bring to them, like Golden Goose or iPhone. And there was this friend of mine, Katya Halitska, who asked me to bring a pack of Advil and a pack of melatonin. Melatonin? Melatonin. 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 That was my first visit to US and since I had a lot of readings and like meetings with the audience there, I met a lot of Ukrainians who live there. Some of them were actually American born and some there live there already for 10, 20 years and they are happy. They are mostly wealthy. They are mostly like feeling good and doing well, but when it comes to the drink and more, more, more honest conversation or some walk at, at the evening in Manhattan or whatsoever, it always, uh, like, the subject of this background pain of homesick person at some point always comes forward and they reveal how they miss their friends from childhood, their, the, the places they used to know from, from when they were kids and whatsoever. And back then, back then, I knew this only from their stories. However, now I'm experienced in this too, as almost six million Ukrainians does do. Yes, <coughs> plural do. Six million Ukrainians do. For we had to leave our home, and a lot of people are now staying uh, due to hospitality of different European countries, or not even European, like in UK and Canada and US and whatsoever. They stay in fairly better conditions that they used to stay at home and they have new doors open for their careers, their, their everything. But still, we all, they all, but I would honestly say we all are desperately homesick and craving to go home. Can I put it that way, like grammatically, yeah. craving to go home? That was the comment I wanted to make. Thank you, Katja. And I actually had had this question for you as a writer who shared. It was not for poems yet. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, if you don't mind us um, answering this, well, no. we've already ventured in this territory of uh, talking about displacement. Um, how does it affect you as a writer? Because you are sharing this experience as you uh, said, with six million people, but you are a writer. It does. It does not really affect me as a writer. Apart from, of course, in Kiev, my life was super organized. I had a nanny, childcare, the separate office to work because I knew my needs before I had a child. It was like child by decision. So, and here, of course, like if I'm lucky enough, in January, I'm gonna finally have three hours per day of childcare. And yes, I, I was really close to getting late here because I still can't get used of can't get used to live in the city as big as London. So I I'm still having all those issues with transportation, being uh, late, taking the bus that goes in different direction. Yeah. Happens to me all the time because you know, right, the, the trick with the directions. And uh, but those are like I mean what really affected me is so I have less time to write, less time to concentrate, but writing is really a part of my personality, so this is something I gonna always find a way to do before I'm dead. In any condition, under any circumstances. However, I discovered that I can't really write about different stuff except for war, mm -hmm. feel of loss, feel of fear, feel of being lost, displaced, like losing all, all, all the world you loved because even when the war gonna end, I mean, we, do you know this, this mm -hmm. war, two generations basically lost their basic feeling, not even two, maybe three generations actually, like my generation, then the children of, of people who had early children and then some, some children who are now like 10, 7 years old. We lost our basic feeling of safety like forever because this is not something that is coming back. Never ever we're going to be confident in our tomorrow. Never ever we will be able to make any long term plans with an easy soul, like, because we know how easily it, it all can be ruined. 
Дивися, дерева розтягують шкіру і в небо повільно опускають коріння, щоб там прорости у горішньому вирії крізь воду, крізь землю, крізь тепле каміння. Ковтають пісок у північні лимани, за темним узгір'ям ворушиться море і світло вихоплює краплі туману з повітря, що мов молоко не прозоре. А ми відчиняємо вікна і двері і мовчки повторюємо завчені сури, бо ніжність – така нетривала матерія і вірність, така ненадійна фактура. Хоч відстань між нами доволі безпечна і ковзає вітер, не пальці по шкірі, хоч ми не дерева. Але безперечно колись ми також проростемо у вирії. Look, the trees are stretching their skins and slowly send roots into the heavens to grow up there in paradise, past water, past earth, past sun-warmed rocks. Midnight estuary swallows sands, the sea moves beyond the dark hills and light catches drops of mist from air, opaque like milk. We open windows and doors but silently repeat memorized lines because tenderness is such unstable material and to be faithful is structurally unsound. The distance between us is relatively safe and the wind runs no fingers over our skin. We are not trees, but surely someday we too will stretch and grow into paradise. Thank you. Oh, this is going to be the Christmas one. <laughs> the New Year wanderers are because in Ukraine. In post-Soviet port of Ukraine, they would not celebrate Christmas, of course, for there was no Christ in Soviet Union, but the New Year if so. This is something also like far from before everything had started. Вона ніколи не ходить одна в кіно. Вона припасла паперу і трошки клею, і ось утеплила вчора собі вікно, і все, що з нею було, було так давно, що ніби було не з нею. Її ніхто не чекає в святкову ніч. Книжки та іграшки збилися пліч у пліч і дивляться з осудом з шаф у її кімнаті. Вона удає, що не знає, у чому річ вона прибере, покурить і ляже спати. Колись у неї був друг, а тепер нема. На диво вчасно прийшла цьогоріч зима, на дворі сніг, і у вікнах горять ялинки, і серед цього всього вона настільки сама, хоч вийчи, велась на стінку. І от годинник усе показав і пробив. За вікнами в небі районний салют, як дешеві квіти. Їй теж, може, хочеться різних казкових див, і вона б загадала собі, щоб він подзвонив, але мережа і без неї всю ніч забита. Тож вона лягає сама, у ліжку для двох, замкнувши двері, Закривши усі фіранки, сховавши себе від святкових чужих тривог, і в тиху кімнату приходить змучений Бог, шукаючи місце перепочити до ранку. І ті, що чекали дива, нервують, коли ж і жлобські салюти ще десь вибухають досі. А Бог сидить невеличкий, як мудрий миш. І думає Бог, як добре, що ти мовчиш, що спиш і нічого не просиш. Дякую. She never goes to the movies alone. Yesterday she got some paper and tape and weatherproofed her window. Everything that happened to her was so long ago that she doesn't even feel that it happened to her. No one waits for her this New Year's night. Books and toys crammed back to back look down sneering from their shelves into the room. She pretends she doesn't know what's up. She'll clean, smoke and go to sleep. Once she had a friend but no more. Winter came on time this year. It's snowing and the Christmas trees are all lit. But in the midst of all this she is totally alone. Others would howl and climb the walls. The clock strikes midnight, the local fireworks explode like cheap flowers. She, too, wants a miracle tonight. She would make a wish that he would phone. But she knows tonight the circuits are overloaded, even without her call. So she lies down alone in her double bed, after shutting the door, drawing the curtains, to hide from other people's holiday fuss. Then a tired god enters her quiet room, looking for a place to rest overnight. Those waiting for miracles are anxious. The piddly fireworks keep popping away, and the god sits like a small, wise mouse. And the god thinks, how good that you are silent. Sleep, and don't ask me for anything. Thank you. Oh, I will steal my microphone. 
Oh. Um, <laughs> there is this logistical procedure. Thank you. Um, I think that after the New Year poem, it's appropriate to ask you about the future. Because, um, you know, like everyone who comes to Ukraine usually points out that Ukraine is a country that is oriented towards the future. Um, and I'm just wondering, like, obviously we're living in this uh, historical moment and there is no going back to the precedented times and this experience will probably change us forever. Um, and I want to ask you, how do you feel about the future and what is the future for Ukrainian poetry and for Ukrainian literature, how this experience will change us? So from the pragmatic point of view, uh, talking about Ukrainian literature and Ukrainian poetry, uh, this experience, of course, uh, gives us a future in the world literature for now. Everybody is curious about, wow, Ukrainians, what do they write? What films do they make? What, what, what do they do in terms of theater, art and whatsoever? But I mean, like normally people are buying that children, that, that is the market, that is how it worked. However, we all would choose, of course, not paying this price, not, I mean, not paying the price of a single life for this promotion opportunity. Then how it gonna change us? Sasha, I have no idea for this did not even end now. I mean, the Second World War had changed like three, four generations and probably was ending at my generation. So we felt distant enough starting to talk about it. So I and a lot of other people were able to write like books about that, about the different experience of mm -hmm. Second World War and Ukraine participating in like uh, real Second World, World War, not the one from Soviet books, or not the one from, from other point of view where Ukraine was other, like, rather blinded as a, as a part of Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. No, nobody would rather consider Ukraine as a separate participant and separate country, so... And then what, what is happening now did not even end now. We don't know how, how long it's gonna last. Uh, how many more people, friends, lovers, children, we're gonna lose, how, what, what, what's gonna come out of it. Maybe uh, in the next few years Ukraine gonna like expand its territories a lot, so there gonna be like new, new context, though we don't need of course any other territories, we would love just to keep our country in our borders and do it our way. Uh, with no fucking interruption from the northern neighbor, but so how 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 can I answer your question? I mean, mm -hmm. it definitely gonna change everybody. Not only Ukrainians, not only those people who are there. It gonna definitely change the world. What is going now? Like, I loved it. Like as Oksana Zabushka put it, said uh, she was having some meeting, I believe, in Warsaw or in Stockholm. This Ukrainian writer, like the famous, the big, the big one. <laughs> she, she's not physically big, she's like, more or less like me, but she's a big one, so. She writes also big books as well, and good books. And somebody asked her like, but how, how you want the international community to react for not to start it all? And she was like, come on, it all? had already started, so this is gonna change the whole world. Not only us, not only me, not only you, not only Olesa, not only you guys, uh, not only those who now like welcoming Ukrainians in their homes, not only those who participate this or that way, that gonna change literally the future of the whole world, but we don't know how, of course. I mean, if they start bombing Chernobyl again, you know, it's gonna change everything very dramatically and unexpectedly, so probably we are gonna end up in 200 years talking uh, with the two heads and everything, you know, like that's I'm trying to be optimistic, you know, but yeah. <laughs> there are so options, there are, there are options. So yeah, I can't, I just simply can't answer this question. Mm -hmm. uh, this Friday, my daughter has her birthday. She's gonna be two. So I was brave enough to order a cake, helium balloons and invite some people in. That is my future. One, after, uh, after what we have experienced uh, this winter, one week planning horizon is a huge, like, long time planning for us, mm -hmm. really. And yeah, that's, that's the future. 
that's the future. My daughter is growing. She's safe. She's gonna know she's Ukrainian. She's gonna know how to protect herself, whatever happens. She's gonna be two on Friday. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> Happy birthday to your daughter, my dear. Um, I think this answers the question beautifully because, you know, it's um, never enough to emphasize that this moment changes us all. And luckily we have voices that will help us put this experience into words and help us explain ourselves and what we've been through and what we are uh, will be through in the nearest future. Okay, uh, this one gonna contain something like Matuki. <laughs> Swear words, obscene language. So if Plus you if you things. if you don't like that, just don't somebody lost copy. the book. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a so if you, if you if you uh, don't want to hear that, you can just close your eye your ears like that. And when it's over, I will give you a sign, like then you can open them again. Kito Chubotiach. Це мої поля і мої сади. Це мої фортеці у далині, мої пасовиська біля води і мої рибини на мілені. При дорозі яблуні і айва, зелені є хміль, зріє виноград, все моє. Трава у траві мишва, а над нею мат польових бригад. Мій чумацький шлях і в могилах прах. 47 чудес всі – АЕС і ГЕС, дим вогнів в лісах, і кадил в церквах, і туман у весі, з озер і плес. Це мої комбайни і трактори. Фабрик, чорний піт і лихоманка жнив, сутінки зійдуть на мої двори, і мої жінки заведуть там спів. Це мої кордони і наркота. Це мої наливки і самогон, це мої сини в теплих животах достигають в мріях про закордон. Мої божевільні від дня до дня восхваляють Господове ім'я – це моя країна. І вся хуйня в цій країні також лише моя. То чого ж ти хочеш, безжальний світ? Що ж мене висмоктуєш у журбі я, і певний блід, і смачний обід, і жінок, і рибу віддав тобі? Розтисни кулак, напрямок чи знак, проміняй на все, не земне і земне. Де ховаєш ту, котра просто так, без мого усього, прийме мене. Work it out. I love this sign, like, pssst. <laughs> Puss in Boots. These are my fields and my gardens. These are my fortresses in the distance, my pastures by the water, and my fish in low water. Apple trees and quince trees by the road, hops growing green, grapes growing ripe. All is mine. Grass, mice in the grass and fields brigades foul language above them. My Milky Way and the dust in the graves, 47 wonders, all the atomic power plants and hydroelectric power stations, the smoke from fires in the woods and from thuribles in the churches, and all the mist from the lakes and stretches of water. These are my combines and, and tractors, and the smoke from the factories and the harvests fever. Twilight will fall on my yards and my women will start singing there. These are my borders and drugs. These are my fruit liqueurs and home distilled vodka. These are my sons and the warm bellies swimming in dreams of emigration. My madman daily, praise God's name. This is my country and all the fucking mess in this country is also only mine. So what do you want, you merciless world? Why do you wear me out in my sorrow? I gave you a certain formidable place and a tasty dinner and women and fish. Unclench your fist, exchange your direction or your sign for all my unearthly and earthly things. Where do you hide her who, for no particular reason, without all these things of mine, will take me? Nizhnist, prozori, bezzachisny bog drybnic, krechitny embryon u gorli mezh vyholosom i vdychom Ніжність, коли вночі з чужої квартири ніяк не знаходиш вихід і дослухаєшся обережно, хто тут де дихає. Ніжність в тобі живе і тебе ж і їсть по собі не лишає ніц. Ніжність поламані промені в склянці, де лайм і коктейльний лід. Ніжність – це коли відстані починають ділитися тільки на до і від, коли заворожено дивишся, як він спить до самого ранку. Ніжність, коли зимою на губах від поцілунків ранки залишають в гігієнічній помаді кривавий слід. 
Ніжність приглушена тепле світло готельних спалень. Затиснених у кулиці людяників кольорове скло, ніжність – це коли масти тобі тату на потилиці, п'яний кремом дешевим від сепсису і запалень, і дує, щоб не пекло. Ніжність – це коли впізнаєш шелест чи нафта серед міської тиші. Зморщений слід від резинки на животі, на плечі, непомітний прищик, ніжність – рандомний і безглуздий набіль деталей. Перепустка у щось, що може статися далі або статися ближче. Tenderness is a transparent and defenseless god of details, a minuscule embryo in the pause between voice and breath. Tenderness is when you can't find the door out of someone's apartment at night and have to listen carefully to people breathe. Tenderness lives inside you and at the same moment devours you till there is nothing left. Tenderness is a shattered reflection in a cocktail glass with ice and lime. Tenderness is when distances only mean to or from. When you watch him sleep till morning, Tenderness is when lips chat from winter kisses leave bloody traces on your lip gloss. Tenderness is the subdued warm light of hotel rooms, multicolored candies melting in your hand. Tenderness is when he wipes the tattoo on the back of your neck with a cheap antiseptic then blows on it so it won't hurt. Tenderness is when you recognize his car's tires in the silence of the city, a crease from an elastic band across the belly, an invisible pimple on the shoulder. Tenderness is a random and senseless collection of details, a ticket to what's happened so far or so close. So this is again was this was again something that was written like 10 years ago or something before before everything had started actually even, even the puss and boots Mm -hmm. which everybody is quoting widely uh, starting from 2014 was actually uh, written before years before that something for the poetic prophetic gift thank you that was beautiful <laughs> thank uh, you. and i think we are ready to take questions from the audience Ooh -hoo, my favorite part of, yes. of any <laughs> meeting uh, and uh, we have the first question. Hi there. You mentioned the generations which have lost their sense of safety, the three generations that have lost their sense of safety. It occurs to me that, uh, well, of course, Ukraine has this very traumatic history of Stalin and, and uh, yes. people. And, um, yes. I wonder what you take from the older generations, for example, your grandparents' generation. <laughs> If you were reading, able, if you were re able to read Ukrainian, I would recommend you the book. My grandfather danced uh, better than everybody else. What did we take? Uh, of course, a lot of trauma, a lot of desire to hide and to be protected, a lot of insecurity, a lot of disrespect towards others because they might be potentially not safe to you because the Soviet system used to encourage people to be hostile towards each other and a lot of what did we take from our parents and grandparents other generations like of course a lot of love which they were not probably able like probably express but we still took it mm -hmm. a lot of fear for our future a lot of desire to make our life better in terms of their, their imagination, in terms of their picture of the world, which did not always obviously made our life better and sometimes made it worse. A lot of craving towards better life, towards something that, that would let us open up. I believe my generation used to be the first one growing up in like relatively safe surrounding. We, we have been growing up in 90s, which was super dark and poor part of Ukrainian history, but still it was kind of safe, like emotionally, politically. Also the Chernobyl had happened when I was one year old, so when I, when I, when I was conscious it was not already something like huge and something. So we were supposed to know how it is to feel safe. I mean, to feel poor, to feel limited in terms of what, what, what you have in the house, to feel maybe uh, somehow 
locked from other other of the world because traveling or studying abroad was still a huge luxury for us but at least to feel safe now we've lost that feeling of safety we i i personally lost it this this uh, february and normally like half of ukraine like the eastern part okay not the half of it but one sort of it people from the eastern part and crimea lost it eight years ago and so now probably my daughter's generation has a chance to, n to gain back this feeling of safety because she's too she did not realize what had happened why did we left in the bomb shelters at nights in Kiev she was a super happy child the happiest child you could ever find in a bomb shelter for she loves dogs and cats and people coming to the basements to the bomb shelters would of course bring their animals with themselves so there is no any Sunday park even Hampstead Heats can't be compared by the number of the dogs and cats to those bomb shelters so she had never seen so many dogs and cats at one place she was super happy there and she enjoyed four days in, in at the border in the line at the Polish border with no gasoline minus 12 temperature no food no water no just you are trying to escape because they are bombing the cities and you don't know where, where are they are gonna stop and she was like oh my god we can eat in the car I can throw things around and nobody says anything some some people come and take me to their homes to wash me up wow and she's enjoying her her new friends here as well as she enjoyed in Wroclaw and she enjoys all the new toys because of course we are not able to move all, all the toys with us from place to place so in every place we are getting new toys a new bed, new new stuff. She's super happy yeah. because of that. She does not understand how unsafe we are, what is going on. So she does not have this trauma and her generation has a chance to feel safe again. Because children, I, I worked when first five months of the full scale invasion, we lived in Wroclaw and I worked with children there, worked with children there a little bit and those who are five, six, seven years old, they are already like slightly broken inside by what had happened to them. I'm not talking about those who had witnessed some awful things or who, who lost their parents or sisters, brothers, but even those who just had to be, you know, like thrown to a different country and uh, pass, go through this experience of getting out of, of the war, war area. That, that's it. You did not ask about that, but you asked about what we get from <coughs> our grandparents. I believe I answered that, but now my daughter's generation is about to be the first one who can feel safe again, hopefully. Fingers crossed. Thank you. Uh, Michael. Oh, thank you. And thank you for mesmerizing, mesmerizing <laughs> performance and all of you for organizing this. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk a bit about the impact of, of the hatred that must now be uh, the the feeling of hatred that must be now permeating uh, an entire population of people. I like can feel a, a level of hatred, that, that justified hatred that we could not imagine. It must have a, an impact on so many aspects of life to feel that kind of anger and hatred towards another another country. Um, just just that. Thank you for your question, Michael. However, I don't know how to comment on that. For uh, on one hand. I've read a lot of things written by uh, survivors of Shoah, of Holocaust, people who survived Auschwitz and other concentration camp, and what they had written about hatred is in sake of your own inner peace and your children and people who are around you, you have to forgive and stop hating. However, they have written that like in 20, 30 years after what they've been through. And I don't like hating. I believe nobody does. This is something that ruins you from inside. This is something so energy consuming and so not nice feeling, right? But then uh, I do feel it. And at the moment, in a way, it makes me stronger too. For every second it reminds me about the purpose of everything I'm doing. I believe we first should win the war and help 
all those people who are suffering because of it, who lost some, some important parts of their life. And then we should talk about hydrus and the impact of it. It's, compl it, it's, it's a complicated and destructive feeling, indeed. But at some point, now it is needed and it is important. I've, I would put it this way. I mean, I'm, I, I truly stand with... Um, Господи, як його людина в пошуках? Віктор Франкл and Edith Eva Eger and whoever else wrote about Germans and Nazis after the, the Second World War and Holocaust. And they all would repeat that you're gonna finally forgive if you wanna stay alive, if you wanna stay constructive, if you wanna stay loving, if you don't want to harm constantly yourself and others, you will have to forgive and accept that. But they have written that like 30 years after that ended. So ask me this again in 20 years, please. <laughs> we'll return Thank to you. this conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Maya. Uh, my question follows on from that, and it's about um, the writing process. You mentioned that it's only now that writers in Ukraine are able to write about the experience of Second World War. And of course, we, you know, whoever's writing, writing from the stories that are told by the grandparents and, you know, putting your own you it, and you wrote about it a little bit in your book as well, but my, uh, my grandfather does better than me. And um, my question is, when do you think you or other writers, Ukrainian writers might be able to write about this war? And I know that you have already written poetry about it, and of course these are just kind of the feelings yeah, that Yeah, I've also now, finished the book and sent it to an editor, like recently. <laughs> <laughs> But do you, do you think we'll be able to write about this war? Yes, for now we are already educated and we know that in order to overcome your trauma and to solve your problems you have to identify them, so you have to be able to talk about that. However, back in Soviet Union and before people were so oppressed that they learned not to talk about what traumatizes them, what hurts them, what did they do, what did they witness, so that, that was the reason why people did not talk about like the generational traumatic experiences. They only now started making films and books and art about like replacement of Crimean people, for instance, to some fucking away districts in, in, in Siberia and uh, about the Ukrainian part of Holocaust, which was also awful, which about the starvation, like Holodomor and everything else. And now we probably know we should talk about it also we learned it even more for we were obliged to talk about what going on to counter-strike the russian propaganda when everything started no i mean not now but in 2014 and obviously now we are all doing this i mean i can recommend you the beautiful book uh, which i haven't finished yet but i will uh, by uh olesa Hromechuk, who's present here who's an amazing writer and wrote uh, had written a book I, I'm truly sorry for <laughs> my English grammar uh, about uh, her experience and her family experience. I, I'm not going to spoil, but yeah, the the death of, the of the so <laughs> the title, so. yeah, the, the death of the soldier told by his sister, which is like my favorite genre by now. Like Katya Petrovska would do uh, perhaps a stair, and then Martin Pollock, Pollock would write about the dead man in the basement. And this is again something like kind of non-fiction and family story, and like the, the the reporting or whatsoever, and kind of very personal fiction piece. So hopefully we are doing it like right away now, and this is important to talk about that not only for people from outside who have to know what is going on, but also first for us to be able once so, so, someone overcome this trauma and also to other Ukrainians who are being now suffering and traumatized, but they for this or that reason, they don't have the proper vocabulary, proper words to talk even about, even to themselves about what is going on for this is important to have a vocabulary to put what you have witnessed, what you feel, what you've been through in words. And so that's what we all are doing now. We are giving those words, those formulas. Like, like, you know, when you read a poem or a book and you say, oh, damn, I can relate. This is right what I am feeling. And the other person put it so precise that let me put it on my Insta story. So send it to my friend who's been through the same scenes or whatsoever. So this is what is important now. So. We are able to talk now already, and this is very important that we can.
this is going to help us in future. And we'll, we'll have to talk about this a lot of time in, in future. I love this idea of literature as something healing and of writing as a healing practice and of reading as a healing practice. But oh, uh, yes, we we'll have time for... Can I ask you, has question. your language changed through the war? Has the war affected you the way how you, how you write? What, you, what words you use, what pictures, what metaphors you use? Not really. I mean, we gained some new metaphors. Uh, which can be not possible to explain you in English because they are very tricky word play in word game word playing in Ukrainian. But am I using this widely in my writing? Yeah, on my Instagram and Facebook, yes. In my writing, probably not. But all that experience, of course, would change our language with time because it changes the state of mind. So the language gonna follow. We have time for uh, the last question. Oh. Um, question. <laughs> well, yes, I can't say no now, right? <laughs> so I would like to ask you about your state of being focused. So the war, full scale war, happened and is still happening. And uh, right now you are in a new city and uh, other things that took your attention and still we have these uh, distractions, if uh, I can call it, it like that. So how uh, are you able to stay focused when it is needed? I don't think I'm able to. <laughs> uh, you don't need me in front of you to Google some techniques about like how to concentrate. And this sh sounds like a shitty advice, however this works. There are li uh, the, 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 the huge amount of techniques how to bring yourself back to yourself when it's really needed. Like when you need to work, to drive, to do something and you're really emotionally overwhelmed by something. I'm trying to use those like I'm not good neither in meditation nor in some mindfulness stuff, but there are some simple exercises like counting, like feeling this, the, the, the surface, like feeling your body. Also, you learn a lot of that when you have a toddler. For when they, ha they are throwing like tantrums or whatsoever, you learn a lot of tricks how to bring <laughs> them back. And like, so I'm doing the same to myself. And I mean, if you if you was writing, asking about the writing, uh, this is really important part of myself. I, if, if somebody would ask me for the rating of the things I love to do and I need to do, I would name like breathing, eating, sleeping, having <laughs> sex and writing. For uh, This is the way I interact with the world. So I don't think I ever had like some, some, some difficulties being concentrated on writing. However, as, I've, as I have mentioned previously, now I can only write about what is going on in this mm -hmm. or that way. This is basically the only subject I can speak about and write about. And I believe this is going to last for another, for another amount of time. That's it. So this is like, I mean, uh, I can be focused on writing, but I can cut completely what is going on for it's not a destruction or something it's just a very important a traumatizing part of my life which is present in everything what I'm doing would you take this as an answer <laughs> thank you very much for the good question I'm very conscious that there are more questions but you'll be able to ask them while you're uh, signing your books and now I just would love to ask Katya to read one more poem before we conclude this is something I have written back in 2013 because it's dedica dedicated to the Heavenly Hundred, the people who were killed during the mass protests at, at Maidan shortly before the, the war started. And when I wrote this, I thought, okay, before this mess ends, I'm gonna end up and close up, like wrap up every readings I give by this exact poem. Yeah, and it's been like nine years I'm doing that, unfortunately. I'm gonna stand up for that, I believe. 
Sorry if I drop the mic again. I mean, not as a metaphor, but literally. Памяти небесної сотні. Коли помираєш, слід пам'ятати про те, що, звісно, перемагає завжди добро, але це не одразу помітно. Що дерева, срібні та ріки солодкі хоч десь та є, і що тільки те, що ти віддав, не завжди твоє. Навіть якщо це усе в тобі світло. Що любити не боляче і не страшно. Навіть тоді, коли від любові тебе охоплює страх і біль, що його не побороти. І в жодному разі не слід уявляти, як будуть після тебе інші. Жити чи помирати, так і не взнавши, хто ти. Тож, коли очікувано чи ні, настає та мить. В місті, де, очевидно, забагато всього горить. В тій країні, котра забагато від тебе хоче, краще швидко перелічити імена дорогих і тих, хто з любов'ю обережно йтиме тепер по слідах твоїх і не закривати очі. Вічна пам'ять. Тонке проміння, що пливе через всі часи. Дорогоцінний дзвін у повітрі. Голубі голоси, відблиски золоті у чужих зіницях. Тож, коли помираєш, слід розпивати собі мерщій. Перетікає життя в життя, як моря в дощі. І тому воно не скінчиться. Дякую. In memory of the heavenly hundred. When you lay dying, you should remember that, of course, good always wins. But it's not perfectly obvious all at once. That there are at least somewhere silver trees and sweet rivers, and that only that which you have given away is forever yours. Even if it is all the light in you. That loving does not give pain or fear, even when in love you're seized by insurmountable fear and pain. And you should better never imagine how, after you, other people will live or die without ever having known who you have been. So when, expectedly or not, that moment comes in a city where obviously too much is on fire, in a country that wants too much from you, it's better to quickly count the names of your dear ones and those who, lovingly, will now carefully tread your ways and not to close your eyes. Eternal Remembrance Thin rays floating through all the times, precious ringing in the air. Light blue voices, golden reflections in other people's eyes. So when you lay dying, you better quick sing to yourself. Life overflows into life like seas into rains. And that's why it won't end. Thank you very much, Phoebe, and while Sasha is occupied by changing the mic, I want to thank Sasha for uh, hosting this event and for the amazing all question and sharing all, all, all the emotions. All thanks go me. to you, Katja. And thanks, of course, to all beautiful. of you. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you to our beautiful audience. Thank you for your thoughtful questions. Um, I would just like to thank our host, Pinch Bar. Yes, the Pinch Bar, you are amazing, guys. <laughs> Um, a quick reminder that the next uh, event of the Ukrainian Institute London will take place this Tuesday in Europe House and it will be a discussion with an amazing journalist Olha Tokariuk about... We studied the same group in the university mm -hmm. for five years and we, we not only studied together, we've been close <laughs> friends. There were four uh, of us. So. I hope you're coming, Kaita, because uh, <laughs> I would love to um, see you again. Um, Thank you so much and uh, please join us in the signing session here. A uh, quick uh, reminder that Katya has a website, katerinababkina.com, where you can also order books uh, uh, to London or to Ukraine, to your friends, to your family. Please don't, uh, uh, don't hesitate to use this opportunity <laughs> <laughs> to Thank make you, an amazing Sasha. Christmas gift. Uh, thank you all very much, and uh, please uh, join us in thank the Thank you, Ukrainian Institute, and Alessia personally for organizing this event.